Hello everyone, how are you all doing? My name is Joel Harris. Thank you guys so much for having me. I am part of the Kintsugi Hope team. In Kintsugi Hope, what I do is I look after the youth side of things, which means I get to do quite a few things. One of the things I get to do is speak to you guys, what's amazing. Today, I have called my talk the cry of a generation. And hopefully by the end of this, you will know what that means, and you'll know why I've called it that. Let's read Exodus 2, 23 to 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Can you hear it? The cry of a generation. A whole nation oppressed, a whole nation under slavery crying out. Every day they were forced into hard labour. Every day they were forced to build these cities. Every day they were beaten, they were hurt and they were treated badly. Every day they cried out. Every day they cried out for change. They cried out for God, cried out in the hope that God might hear them and something could change in their lives. Every day they cried out a cry of a generation. And the thing is, God heard their cries. God heard the cries of his people and he remembered the promise he had given them. The promise he had given the Israelites. Reading this passage and hearing about the Israelites crying out to God, I can't help but read this and hear my generation. I can't help but read this and hear the cry of my generation. The cry of Generation Z. Because we too are captives, not into slavery, not to clay and mortar to an Egyptian master, but we too are captives. You see, my generation is enslaved. We are captives of poor mental health. We are imprisoned by comparison. We are locked up by the lack of self-worth. We are enslaved by the consistent show reel. You see, our lives are so easily controlled by these issues. We too are slaves. It's like we have these invisible chains around us that have trapped us. Who's here been on a roller coaster? I hate roller coasters. I've only been on one in my entire life and it was the worst experience of my life. I hate them. So looking back on it, I was queuing up for my death, it seemed like. Queuing up, I got to the front of the queue, we got placed onto this little cart, this little cart, and it was like, this isn't good. This doesn't seem safe. I'm looking at this cart and I'm like, this is flimsy. This isn't going to hold my weight. This isn't going to keep me alive. And this small metal bar comes down around my waist. I'm like, oh, that's cute. And I start looking around for like a seat belt, like a harness, a helmet, a parachute, anything that's going to keep me alive on this death trap. And we start to move. And that's when it dawns on me that this little metal bar is what's meant to keep me alive. This metal bar is what's meant to keep me safe. And we're going up this very steep incline, and I'm praying, like, I am prophesying, I'm speaking in tongues, I'm crying out for God, asking for the second coming to happen right now, because I don't want to go on this roller coaster. Literally, my spiritual movement, my spiritual life was so good, climbing up the roller coaster, I was praying that much. And we get to the top, and I look to my right, and I see this beautiful view. This view of the English countryside, there's hills, there's a river, it's gorgeous. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Ah! And I start falling down this roller coaster. I start plummeting to my death. And you see, the thing was, I wanted to stay at the top of the roller coaster. I wanted to be up there and look at the view. But the roller coaster had me trapped, and it decided where I wanted to go. As much as I wanted to be up here, I was locked onto this force of the roller coaster, and it was choosing where I went. You see, a lot of the time, our mental health can leave us trapped like that. We are on this roller coaster and we can't get off and we can't stop. 
We're wanting to live our life and to be free, but our mental health is controlling us. It's like we're speeding down this roller coaster of life and we're wanting to stop, we're wanting to get off, but we can't because this roller coaster, because this mental health has us trapped and has us controlled. We are captives to our mental health. And you can hear our cries. You hear our cries when we post revealing photos on Instagram to get likes. You hear our cries when we jump from relationship to relationship just to try and get some acceptance. You hear our cries when we get drunk just so we have enough self-esteem and self-worth to speak to someone. You hear our cries when we misbehave and treat people badly because we're hurt inside. These are our cries. The cries for help cries for change, the cries and hope someone is listening. These are the cries of my generation. And the most beautiful thing is, even if no one else hears, even if all everyone else sees is a self-seeking, self-indulgement entitled generation, God hears our cries. God hears our cries. And you know, the thing is, he's made a promise to us, much like he made a promise to the Israelites. And like he kept the promise to the Israelites, he's going to keep the promise to us. And that promise, that promise comes in the form of Jesus. And we see Jesus say in this promise, in Luke 4, 18, Jesus goes, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me. To proclaim the good news to the poor, he has set me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. This includes my generation. This counts for us. You see, Jesus has come to set the oppressed free, physically and mentally. Jesus has come to free us from poor mental health. How amazing is that? The thing is, we, he's heard our cries. God's heard our cry of this. He's come to set the oppressed free. He's come to set us free. We can escape. We can be free from this controlling thing of poor mental health. We can get off the roller coaster. But we just need a helping hand. So, a couple months ago, I did an escape room. And quite like the roller coaster experience, if you haven't done one, don't do it. Roller coasters are designed to kill you. Escape rooms are designed to make you feel stupid. What happens is you go to this escape room. It's kind of like fun. Woo, look at us. We're going to escape room. Yay. You walk into this room and you get locked into this room. It's like a bedroom of sorts kind of thing. And they go, you've got to escape. And you look around. You're like, it's a bedroom. I can't find any clues. You're meant to find clues and let's escape. And like, I'm going to be stuck here for life. You end up feeling so stupid because you can't find anything. You're like, oh, should have paid more attention in class. I literally can't find anything. Finally, after a while, we were looking around. We found four pieces of paper. We found four clues. And we all we all there. We placed the clues down. We're like, what on earth do these mean? I cannot figure this out. We felt so stupid. But the thing is, the company of the escape room knew that as well, because they gave us a walkie-talkie. And they said, hey, if you need any clues, we can push you forward a bit if you just call us and say we need help. So after a while of feeling really stupid, of realising we aren't that smart, we called and went, hey, can you um, help us? Maybe give us a few clues kind of thing. And the thing is, bless them, they didn't laugh. They go, ha ah, you're stupid, you're dumb. They went, yeah, of course. We can guide you through. We looked so stupid, yet they didn't laugh. They guided us through. They guided us through the process when we were trapped. This is the kind of thing what God did with the Israelites. He didn't look at them trapped and say, ah, look at you, stupid, you're trapped. No, he sent someone in to bring them out. And he will do the same for us. When Moses came as his rescuer to the Israelites, it was a sign. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. So a foreshadowing of the fact that one day God would come himself and be our rescuer to leave the roller coaster behind and guide us into freedom. God sent his son Jesus to free us from poor mental health. 
And for some of you today, that's all you need to hear. That's all you need to know. You need to understand this truth that God has sent his son down to free us from poor mental health. And the place you're in right now, you don't have to stay there. There is freedom. There is breakthrough. And God has brought that. For some of you, that's all you need to hear. Then for other you, others of you, as you've been listening to this, you realise you have a heart for my generation. You want to help my generation. You realise my generation is crying out. And you want to help, but you don't know how. Oh, well, I'm here. I can tell you. If we're going to help my generation, if we're going to free my generation from the shackles of poor mental health, we've got to use our secret weapon. We've got to use our secret power. And that is love. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. If we're going to be used by God, if we're going to be part of the redemption of my generation, our tool will be love. Many scientists and researchers have found out that love actually heals physical and mental illnesses. You see, love boosts your immune system. It relieves you of stress. It heals your body. It soothes your anxiety and it combats depression. And it can actually cause us to live longer. Love is so powerful. Why do you think John Lewis made that advert at Christmas a few years ago? The power of love. It's because it is powerful. It's because it works. That's why they sang it. The biggest thing the older generation can do to help us is to love us. Not to judge us. Not to think that we're being trapped by our phones. But to simply love us. Because love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4 8. And I know this firsthand. When I was struggling with depression, when I was going through a rough patch, what helped me, what brought me out of it, was me being able to go to my friends going, hey, look, I'm struggling. Was me showing my emotions and being real. But it wasn't just that. It was me being able to go to my mentor and go, hey, look, I'm struggling. Life's not good. I'm finding this hard. And him able to love me through that. What got me through wasn't just people my age loving me and caring for me, and that did help. But it was me being able to go to older people, going to adults, people who I trusted, people who I admired, and then going, hey, life isn't easy. You'll get through this. And they loved me through it. What showed me Jesus when I was struggling with mental health was people loving me, was walking beside me, not trying to fix me, but simply walking alongside me, journeying with me. I think we need to get into the habit of the older generation coming alongside the younger generation and walking alongside them, not trying to fix them, not trying to go, hey, in our day, this is what happened, but simply loving them. Our dream for Kansugi Hope Youth is to help the church support my generation with their mental health. At the heart of this dream are our wellbeing groups, places for teenagers to find acceptance, to know they are loved, and to find hope. You know, once a teenager feels accepted, once they feel belonged, once they feel safe and they feel supported, they will open up. They will share what they are struggling with. They will be vulnerable. And when you're in a group where people are vulnerable and they share that stuff, that's when people will find healing and people will learn how to have a positive well-being. But can I be honest with you? Can I be serious with you guys? We can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. We need your help. We need all those who love Jesus and have a passion to help my generation, to see my generation be freed from the shackles of mental health to help us. We need all those who can hear the cries of my generation to come and to be used by God to rescue my generation. God demonstrated his love to the Israelites by sending Moses. Maybe God is going to demonstrate his love to my generation by sending you. When God sent Moses to free the Israelites, he sent ten signs to help the Israelites break free. When I finish, 
I want to give you 10 things you can do to help break my generation three from shackles and mental health. One, please don't judge us. Two, get to know us, walk alongside us, spend time with actual teenagers. Three, invest in us. Four, pray for us. Five, learn about our issues. Six, be honest with us. Share us where you've struggled. Share us what you're going through or what you have gone through. Seven, trust us. Eight, create safe and supportive spaces for us. Nine, protect us. And ten, very simply, love us. Wildfire